everyone. Welcome. Um, my name is Greer Luce. I am the Curator of Education and Public Programs here at Morven, and I just want to welcome you again to Morven Museum and Garden for this awesome Love Your Leaves program that we're doing with Sustainable Princeton in partnership with Sustainable Princeton. Um, so I'm not going to stand up here too long. Um, I just want to um, thank uh, Sustainable Princeton for organizing this event with us um, as a property that preserves the natural landscape as well as the historic landscape here in Princeton. It's really important for us to be looking towards uh, sustainable education and ways that we can better help our environment and our community and our partnership with Sustainable Princeton is really helping us to do that. So we're very grateful. Um, so without further ado, I'm going to hand things over to the Executive Director of Sustainable Princeton, Christine Symington. Thank you. Thank you so much, Greer, and um, hello and welcome to everyone on the on attending virtually. I just want to say what a pleasure it's been to work with Morvan and with uh, the Master Gardeners in organizing this event. You know, it's through partnerships and collaboration, you know, that we'll be able to work uh, together as a community to make our community more sustainable. Um, just a quick two second uh, introduction about Sustainable Princeton. So we're a nonprofit who works within the community. And one of our missions is to help protect our local ecosystem. Uh, we have wonderful organizations in the town like Morvin, Friends of Heron Town Woods, Friends of Princeton Open Space, DNR Greenway, Charles uh, Rogers Refuge, um, the Ridgeview Conservancy, um, who are doing a terrific job of managing our open spaces. Um, and so, but they're, all of our ecosystem is connected. So it's really important that private property owners, homeowners, um, and commercial property owners see their yards and their grounds as part of that larger ecosystem. So um, one of our areas of focus is to have educational events like this to help us all learn these tools and skills of how we can have our little patch of what we have um, uh, of our own to make it uh, more sustainable and contribute to the goals of making our ecosystem more resilient to climate change, uh, protect habitat diversity. And leaves is a one of those topics where, um, because Princeton has a lot of beautiful trees and a lot of leaves, um, that it's it's a topic where they, we can really do something to look at them as an asset <clears throat> rather than a nuisance. So thank you so much for coming. And again, thanks to Morvin and to the Master Gardeners for working with, on, uh, working with us on this. Thanks. So I'm gonna hand it over to Louise or Greer. <laughs> Okay. okay. Thank you so much, Christine. And I just wanted to do a quick introduction for our amazing speaker today, who is Morvin's horticulturist um, and a master gardener herself. Um, so I, now we're going to hand things over to Louise Sr. Thank you, Louise. Hello, everybody. Are we? Oh, thank you, Joe. Give a big hand to Joe Murphy, our tech guru here. <laughs> I don't, he doesn't get enough of our appreciation. It's just wonderful having him do this. Um, that said, Joe, it's not showing on my screen. It's up there, but it's in here. Yay, perfect. See, it's magic. <laughs> okay. Um, so today, uh, though I do work here at Morvin, I also am an active master gardener. And I'm presenting today on behalf of the Master Gardeners of Mercer County. We're part of Rutgers Cooperative Extension, which exists to get research and information out from our state research university to the citizens of each of our counties in the state, and actually counties all over the U United States. All of our programming is in accordance with anti-discrimination policies. Uh, we're here for everybody, as is Morvin, of course, but this is just the a um, little bit there. And just in case any of you are interested in becoming a Master Gardener, you can find out a lot more about this at the web link uh, above on this uh, slide. And I think it's also on your handout as well, up on the top right. The requirements to become a Master Gardener are to complete a training course and then complete um, 
a group of hands-on practical training uh, projects and answering and working in a helpline office answering questions and also working with educational activities. It's a lot of fun. You should check us out. The more the merrier. And it's not too late, probably, to get into the new class that's gonna start in, uh, in early October. So if any of you are interested, you should contact our brand new coordinator, Justine Gray, through, uh, through the websites that are on your, your page. So thank you all for joining us on this rainy fall day as the leaves are starting to fall here. We're happy uh, to be sharing uh, this talk with Sustainable Princeton and our community. Catherine Horrigan, another Master Gardener, and I developed this talk way back in 2014. And I, I can't believe almost 10 years later, here I am giving it again. Um, so I just wanted to give Catherine due credit as my co-author uh, and she hails from the UK, so sadly you're not going to enjoy her lovely British accent, which is always a boon to garden presentations. You're stuck with my Jersey girl accent. Um, so most of us living in Mercer County have a lot of leaves to contend with starting around now or maybe next month. Oh, okay. <laughs> nice ring okay starting around this time of year and many of our streets start to look like this okay so you can see um <laughs> so leaf management becomes a big chore for a lot of us both for homeowners and for our communities you know we most of us pay taxes so we're in, interested in that Many streets become navigation nightmares as we try to drive or bike through narrow gauntlets sometimes of leaf piles. Leaves can be slippery underfoot, on sidewalks, on driveways, streets, and parking lots. So today I want to offer up some alternatives to just raking all of your leaves into or blowing them into the street for municipal pickup, which I know not all townships have possibly, but here in Princeton, Lawrence, our neighboring communities, we have a lot of people that, you know, the municipalities pick up the leaves. So I'm just going to try to give you some alternatives. Our original talk was um, centered around these sort of seven different uh, management strategies. And uh, I'm going to describe these methods today. So you, you can read. I don't need to read these off to you. I think they're also on your handouts. Your green handout, by the way, has links on it that I just double checked this morning to make sure, because when you write a program in 2014 and it's now 2023, links, something changes on the internet and even all the records fact sheets had different links. So these are all updated. I can't guarantee how long they'll stay updated, but if you look at them today, they're probably there. <laughs> so, and so you don't need to write some of those things down as I talk. So, but first, why should we bother keeping leaves on our properties? Uh, the first reason is that it's the natural way that soil is created and enriched in wild landscapes. Leaves fall in our forests and create rich, fertile soil every year with absolutely no intervention from humans. Why would we ever want to give away all that rich, fertile soil? Well, one reason is that, as you can see um, in the, uh, the upper photo, our forests don't have lawns. They don't have turf growing under the trees. And so if we left all the leaves that fall in some of our properties on the grass, the leaf litter might become so thick that the turf will die. And most of us don't want that. Though some people now are trying to give up on their lawns. And uh, this is a book called Lawn Gone. And this is, you know, you, there are strategies for getting rid of your lawn. I won't really talk about those too much today. Uh, the message here is that we should leave the leaves in particular places on our properties to build and feed our soil. Ecologically leaving leaves benefits wildlife enormously by protecting beneficial insects over the winter. So if you get rid, if you vacuum up every leaf on your whole landscape and ship them away uh, through the municipality, that interrupts the food web for insects such as bees and butterflies, and also for the birds that feed on them. We don't think of butterflies as being food, but birds eat a lot of their caterpillars. 
even insects like millipedes that break down plant debris, ladybugs and spiders that provide pest control for us. They're out there doing our, our work, hard work, killing the bad bugs for us uh, in the spring and summer, but they need those leaf piles um, so that they can have their larvae grow and overwinter. A lot of us now are concerned with the dwindling firefly or lightning bug population. Their larvae also overwinter in soil and in leaf litter. And sometimes they require as up 18 months or even more for their larvae to become adults. So they need some places, they need some leaf piles around to, uh, to make their home. And also, those larvae, you know, the lightning bug larvae at least, are predatory. So they're out there dining on other larvae uh, and worms and snails sometimes. And this is just really important because those predatory insects help us keep some of our bad bugs in check, under control. So it's all, all important. Another reason we should bother to leave our leaves is to reduce the need for fertilizer on our lawns. That's the little white, white chemical being poured into a spreader uh, on our lawns and gardens. Uh, back in 2011, New Jersey passed legislation making the use of fertilizers containing nitrogen and or controlling the use of nitrogen and phosphorus on home landscapes. Um, they were being overused. Most of them were being washed away into our streets and then down into our, our rivers and streams and causing problems there. Um, and so now it's actually illegal in New Jersey to fertilize your lawns between November 15th and April 1st with those chemical fertilizers. By managing your leaves at home and in uh, mowing your leaves into your lawns, you can help reduce the need for those fertilizers and you can save money too. You don't have to buy that stuff. Keeping your leaves closer to where they fall reduces energy expenditure. And this is near and dear, of course, to sustainable Princeton's heart. And again, it saves you money, saves all of us money in taxes. Um, and it keeps them out of landfills, which again, New Jersey passed a law way back in 1990, banning the disposal of leaves and yard trimmings into landfills. This was incentive for many municipalities to start composting facilities for leaves and brush. Princeton and Lawrenceville share a site at the Mayor Ecological uh, Center out on Princeton Pike. I'm pointing over there because that's the direction of it. And it's a terrific example of municipalities in cooperation for sustainable uses, but they, they do drive around and pick it up and take it over there and then they come back and, and deliver it sometimes. But raking the massive piles of leaves into our streets and towns to collect has caused problems with stormwater drains. We're getting more and more of our rainfall in the fall um, with climate shifts, and the leaves can really clog up our drains. In Princeton, this has really exacerbated some of our fall flooding in recent years. Some towns have tried to regulate this by um, requiring the use of leaf bags, which you see here. They don't you know, they usually don't make it into a leaf drain to, or a storm drain to clog it. Other towns sometimes use straw bales as blocks to keep leaves out of the storm drains. Um, but another reason is really just sheer economics. Uh, I don't have an exact figure for the cost of managing residential leaves each fall here in Princeton, but a few years ago I asked our public works department uh, for a figure, and they said, well, we can't really pin it down specifically, but the head of public works told me that there were essentially 43 workdays a year devoted to leaf collection and scheduled for the fall, and that's between early October and, you know, almost mid-December. On each of these days, there's a crew of at least four employees and a lot of heavy equipment that goes out to collect bag leaves and loose leaves. And they do that all day long on those days. For about three weeks during peak leaf season, late October to early November, they'll run two, three, two or three, four to six person crews going around collecting leaves. So obviously we pay for all that in our taxes. And I think that our municipal workers 
could probably be doing some other things instead. I'm not saying that they should be, you know, that the staff should be cut. I think that they could be uh, deployed to fix sidewalks, do some road maintenance, all those potholes and things. There's tree work. There's lots of other work that they could be doing, and we could maybe, maybe even get our taxes a little bit lower. So um, way back, again, when one of the inspirations for this talk initially was an article in the New York Times, and the link is on, on this uh, handout, I think on the back. Um, back in 2013 in uh, Westchester, New York, uh, a town published that they spent $3.5 million a year. That's almost, ten, that is 10 years ago. So 10 years ago dollars, $3.5 million a year with private contractors who went around and hauled away leaves in tractor trailers, and they took them off to commercial composting sites in places like Orange County, New York, and Connecticut. And people, you know, lobbied, and they realized that this was a crazy waste of money, and they launched a love them and leave them campaign, much like Sustainable Princeton has been um, pursuing here in Princeton, uh, to try to cut costs and improve local ecology. And they really have saved millions of dollars in the last decade. So there we go. Okay, so before I go on, there are sometimes some leaves that we might not want uh, to keep on our properties. Some people are, actually most of us, are, are uh, sensitive to poison ivy, poison oak, sumac. So you would prefer not to compost them and collect them. Um, and not to handle them too much in your yard. Also, black walnut leaves contain a, an element called juglone, and this inhibits plant growth. Most of the juglone is actually in their roots and in the nut hulls, um, but the leaves do contain some. So if you know that you have mainly black walnut tree leaves in your leaf pile, you probably don't want to use those on your beloved uh, perennial bed, so things like that, because they will um, inhibit growth of plants. In municipal compost or most home compost, the percentage of them is very small and they get diluted down. Uh, so you don't have to worry about those. Um, some Generally, you'd prefer to dispose of diseased plant material too, rather than put it in your compost pile. Things like uh, if you are a, a vegetable gardener, you, and if your tomatoes look like they got a blight of some kind, you probably don't want to put those vines and things into your compost. Uh, cucumbers and um, summer and winter squash sometimes get squash bugs, and you might not want to put those eggs into your compost either. Um, and then sometimes there's mildews or diseases on plants. Even though we're not supposed to put the bulk of our leaves into our municipal trash. It's okay to bundle up things like poison ivy or a few select items and throw them out. And that's what I would advise to most of you. Um, also, if you, if you know that something has just recently been treated with an herbicide or pesticide, you might want to avoid using those in your mulch. But most, but spraying on fruit trees usually happens months before any of the leaves fall. Um, you know, it's usually more of a spring re regimen. And those, um, those have generally broken down sufficiently so you don't have to worry about putting them into your compost if you use those kinds of things. Higher lignin containing leaves, that's sort of really tough leaves like uh, beech, birch, hornbeam, some oaks, uh, chestnut, uh, magnolia leaves, holly leaves, um, these take more time to break down. They're pretty big. And I would advise that they're really better, truly better shredded. But that could come at the cost of losing some of your insect life. But if they've just fallen, you can shred them because they probably haven't been, uh, probably aren't occupied yet. So now I'm going to get into my numbers of things. That was all my caveats. Um, Here's my first suggestion for managing your leaves on your property. And I think it's one of the easiest ones too, especially when you have somebody else, like your son, <laughs> mowing your lawns. Most lawn mowers are now equipped with mulching capability. And I believe the electric lawn mowers that Sustainable Princeton is promoting would have that capacity as well. And I hope that everybody is using this already and mowing your lawns tall, you know, leaving at least three inches of growth. 
The grass clippings are a fine way to feed your lawn, uh, reducing your need for the expensive and sometimes banned in some seasons fertilizer. Mulch mowing is absolutely not correlated with thatching of lawns, you know, when they get very thick and have problems growing. Um, and this is something that you can learn a lot more from Rutgers uh, fact sheets and Master Gardeners. It's something that's taught in our lawn care courses that the thatching is not caused by mulching, mulching the grass clippings in. Um, the most effective way to mulch your leaves with your lawnmower is to mow them when they're dry and hopefully dried up a little bit too. So they've fallen and they've gotten a little crispy on your lawn. Um, you can see my son here is mowing leaves into our lawn and it's easiest to do when the leaves are not super thick, uh, at least with a little home mower. Some mowers might be much more heavy duty and you might be able to go grind through bigger ones. Um, you can do multiple passes over uh, to keep the leaves uh, uh, out, uh, keep the leaves broken down. Uh, you can see one test is you can look down and see green grass. And this is a caveat also. If you're mulching your leaves with your lawnmower, when you look down after you've taken a pass and you look down at your foot and you can see plenty of green grass and some leaf particles, that's good. If the leaves are so shredded that you don't see any grass, then you need to maybe rake them up or collect them because that grass is probably not going to grow so well up through those. So just, you know, just do a, a, a common sense test looking at them that way. There are heavy duty mowers and we've been experimenting uh, the last two years, grinding some of our leaves here at Moravin uh, to use. I like to use them as mulch on our vegetable beds. Um, but we have a pile where the leaves get put in, uh, in the fall on our front lawn. And uh, my colleague, Charlie, brings in his hand lawn mower, and we've been trying to test how much time his way of just taking the lawnmower over and over and over them versus my other methods. And we're pretty much about even, but you can just mow them in place. You just might have to take extra, uh, extra passes over it. Another thing, after weeding, so for another use of your leaves, after weeding, it's important to, to try to stop the reappearance of your leaves, of your weeds. So adding a layer of shredded leaves helps keep the weeds at bay by suppressing the germination of those weed seeds that get disturbed when you pull them out. It also has other beneficial effects, just like with your lawn. It helps build better soil structure in your, your garden beds and the leaves break down and they provide very good um, cover. Uh, even the shredded ones will provide some cover and shelter for wildlife. This is, uh, this is an area, some, you don't have to shred them. You can also just rake the leaves onto a flower garden. This is a great way to provide wildlife shelter. That's insect shelter for your gardens. Um, some people are afraid that they blow around. I have not had problems with that, but if you have a high visibility bed, I'd recommend maybe shredding the leaves and putting them down as mulch because it, it tends to look a little tidier to people. And I don't find the shredded leaves, uh, I've never had problems with them blowing around. Um, if most of your leaves are very flat, such as maple leaves, maple leaves have a tendency to lie very flat on each other and they form a thick mat, you might want to uh, stir them up so that they, you might not want to rake those right into a bed or leave them there because they really will form a very thick mat and suppress growth of, of things around them. Um, and so that's another reason why I go in and shred some leaves. Here's, um, here's the bed, the first bed that I showed with just the little hose after weeding. And then here it is covered with some shredded leaves so that they don't uh, form a mat. And that's just the idea for your public places. It looks a little tidier. I also think leaves are wonderful for vegetable gardens. And when you're putting your garden to bed uh, for the winter, because most of us don't leave vegetable plants up, you know, for insects in the fall, like we might do with our perennial and flower gardens. Um, 
First, I clean up the beds, removing last season's plants, anything diseased, any weeds. Then I add amendments such as uh, green sand, which is mined here in New Jersey, or azomite uh, for potassium and extra trace elements. And then I put in a layer of compost, finished compost, leaf compost on top, and then sometimes even some composted manure to feed the vegetable beds. Then I seal it with wet newspapers, as I think you saw in a, a previous part here. Uh, just the newsprint sections and about four pages thick. Believe it or not, there's a master's degree that was written about using newspaper as mulching and they determined the thickness was best. And you can find that online somewhere. I don't have the link. Um, but then over the newsprint, that's then I put the leaves on top of that. And it really helps hold in, uh, you know, suppress le uh, any weeds over the winter and it keeps the soil moist. It keeps the microorganisms alive in your vegetable soil. So your soil stays alive and uh, it prevents outgassing of elements as, you know, if you leave the beds uncovered, then you lose a lot of nutrition out of them just into thin air, literally. And so this is one of the things I love to do. If I'm planting winter crops like garlic, things that grow over the winter, then I wouldn't, I'd leave a, a narrow strip uh, of between the newspaper that's straight in the soil, plant the garlic, and then just put the shredded leaves on top of that. I wouldn't put the newspaper over the garlic. It would probably go through it, but it seems like a little bit of extra work for it. Huh? It might be biased. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I can tell you stories about children working with newspaper and sometimes they don't want to put certain pictures down because they think it'll uh, not inspire things to grow. Oh, okay. Um, so you can also use your fall leaves and this is all in the same kind of, of idea. Uh, uh, several years ago there was a method called lasagna gardening uh, that was uh, popularized by Patricia, Patricia Lanza in her book. Uh, it was published in 1998, uh, and it's up here. And the idea, as you can see in this uh, diagram, is you alternate um, layers of browns and greens, which if you compost, you may be familiar with those ideas. Um, greens are things like veggie scraps and garden clippings. Browns are shredded leaves in in this talk, and you can use other things for, for browns. You can shred up newspaper and other things like that as well. Uh, you top, I top off the lasagna garden with a nice layer of compost, and then you can often plant directly into that top layer, or you can just let it sit through the winter and it'll be all ready for planting in the spring. I like to do the lasagna gardens planning uh, sort of now, you know, in the fall. I think it's a good time to get them set up and let them go. Um, and because that's when I have all the leaves to use. So, uh, and here are two flower beds that I made at my house using this lasagna gardening method around the bases of trees in my yard. And uh, you have to remember not to build the soil up too high. You always wanna see that flare, the root flare of trees. You don't wanna uh, go beyond that for the health of your trees. Uh, but I wanted to have garden beds around the trees um, to help protect them from string trimmers and lawnmower damage because they can, you know, when you mow right up to the tree, you can damage the bark. So these are, are things, and that's, uh, I, I think they worked very nicely doing lasagnas around my trees like this. Um, my co-author, Catherine Horgan, that I mentioned, uh, created a, a new garden bed in her old house using a modified lasagna garden. She started it in the fall, and in the top right, let's see, the top right picture uh, was, was taken the following year in early summer. She had already planted some shrubs, including some oak leaf hydrangeas. The bottom right picture was taken the following summer, and you can see it was pretty successful. Things grew like crazy, and she was not weeding grass out of it at all. It really did smother the grass. Uh, her steps, she wanted to work with materials that she had on hand rather than buying a bunch of stuff. And uh, she just had, had new windows fitted into her house. And so she had all this cardboard. These days, you know, unlike 10 years ago, most people have a lot of cardboard around from your Amazon deliveries. <laughs> Um, 
but she wetted down the cardboard and put those down first on the lawn. Then she covered them, uh, the damp cardboard with as many leaves as she could get her hands on and then compost and a little bit of topsoil. Uh, she did not use food scraps like Patricia Lanza uh, recommends in her lasagna gardening book because she has a dog. And she has an unruly dog who would, if there were food scraps, would just revel in digging them up and eating them. So she left the food scraps out. Um, and this was a very successful method for her. When she moved a few years later, she did it again in her new house and it worked just as well. So it wasn't a, a one-time thing. We mentioned before that putting leaves on your beds improves the soil. There's actually scientific proof of this uh, from several years ago now. It's not just our observation. The research was done by the late um, Daniel Kulczynski of Rutgers, who kindly allowed me to use his slides. And this is what the soil looked like with no leaf amendments added. So you can see leaves zero inch. <laughs> it's kind of dry, there's cracks in it. It was an open farm field. Um, and there was a three year study period where farmers added six inches of leaves, just you know, a full six inches of leaves every year. And <clears throat> they were uncomposted leaves. They were just fresh you know, from the fall pickups in the three, three year study. The soil uh, changed dramatically you know, through this process. Organic matter, of course, increased along with soil tilth and the moisture holding capacity was greatly increased. Soil tilth, by the, uh, by the way, is the state of aggregation, I'm reading a definition here, the state of aggregation of a soil, especially in relation to its suitability for crop growth. It's kind of a combination of how dense the particles are and how much water it holds. It's a, a, an old, old fashioned term, tilth. Um, <clears throat> so these leaves were only placed on top of the fields. They were not um, turned in. They were not um, you know, plowed in or anything like that. They weren't, nobody went out there and turned them, you know, like your compost pile, anything like that. There is a fact sheet uh, from Rutgers. It's fact sheet 822. I think there's a link uh, to that on your, your handout. And uh, that describes it, so. There's also several other Rutgers fact sheets about using leaf compost in the home landscape and, and all of these things. Uh, our fourth method uh, for using up leaves is to use them as cover for tender crops, tender plants. Uh, my co-author Catherine pots up bulbs and she enters the Philadelphia Flower Show most years. The Philadelphia, you know, and it's returning to a uh, March timeframe again this year. So she'll be doing it again. Um, she, and this is a way of forcing bulbs. She pots the bulbs up and then she puts them in the window well at her house. You know, the, those sort of aluminum things, right? You know, giving basement light kind of things. She puts her pots in there. She puts, plants the bulbs, waters them lightly, puts them in. And she then bury, she rakes her leaves or moves them into those, fills them up, buries them in the leaves. And this keeps them from actually freezing, but they do get cold enough to, um, uh, to have their growth uh, spark so that she can uh, force them. You have to bring them into the heat after certain numbers of weeks, depending on, on the bulb variety to get them to bloom. Um, so if, you know, she usually, stows hers away in mid to late October for the flower show, depending on the bulb and what it needs. If you wanna get flowers by Valentine's Day, maybe tulips or something like that, you might wanna move it up, maybe put them in in late September. Uh, we recommend that if you want to uh, have your flowers blooming by a certain date, forcing them, that you do several pots, you know, maybe one Every, every week or every five days over a period of time, just so that you can get a good window. One of them will be blooming on the day that you wanted it to. So, and that's what she does. That's how she gets her ribbons at the flower show uh, by doing that. No, she doesn't. Um, no, 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 they're in pots. Yeah, they're in flower pots. Well, for the ones that she forces, yeah. The ones that she forces for the flower show or other things. Yeah, she buys some bots. And she does say that if, um, 
most of us are probably just going to go to a local store, Ace Hardware or wherever and get bulbs. But if you're ordering a specific variety, if that's important to you, like it needs to be for the competitions at the flower show, you need to tell the online or mail order bulb supplier that you want them right away, because otherwise they'll not send them to you until it's the right time to plant them outside, which might be late October or November. So, um, but it's a good way to, it's another way to use leaves that people don't always think about. And here is uh, Narcissus Topolino, and that was one of her prize winners. So that's the result of a little pot buried in a window, sill, uh, window well. Hmm? Excuse me? I'd say a lot of pots. Well, no, it's one pot oh, no, with those bulbs planted oh, densely. Great. Yeah, I'm sorry. I just assume that everybody goes to the Philadelphia Flower Show because I do. But I know that, yeah, they have, they have a big competition area where people, you know, bring in their, their items. And that's what this is about. Uh, so again, uh, more on cover for tender plants. Um, you know, you can, it's not just bulbs that are tender. Uh, tender perennials, if any of you grow agapanthus, uh, which cannot freeze here, uh, that can be buried. Rosemary tends to be kind of uh, susceptible to our New Jersey winters, and it could benefit from being buried in leaves, some insulation. Uh, lavenders sometimes benefit it. They'll like the protection. Um, if you have newly planted roses, like we have right out here in our, our newly, there's a, a little... Um, bird bath outside. We have new roses there. I intend to cover the root crowns with, with leaves to just give them some insulation because they aren't mature enough yet. Their root systems won't be deep enough uh, to live through potentially some of those freeze-thaw cycles that we get here. And we're getting more and more of them. With more warm days in the winter, things heat up and then they freeze again. And that constant fluctuation is really hard on our, our plant roots. And you can help protect your perennials. And, you know, climbing roses, other roses. Yes? Um, the idea of putting the leaves in the window well, uh -huh. does that in any way, uh, if you have all those leaves, does that make a nice warm home for like mice that you it would could. put there? I'm sure it could. Um, and they might want to eat the tulips as well. Um, I'm not sure. Uh, Catherine hasn't had any problems with that. I've done it a couple of times and I, at my house and I didn't have any problems with it. But it's the question for those online, if you didn't hear it in our ambient sound, uh, was that putting leaves as in your window wells, might that encourage mice or other, other mammals to move in? And it, it could, but I have not had direct experience with that myself. So, oh, okay, yes. I just wanted to ask, what role do invasives play? Like, does it matter if some of these leaves are not the kind of leaves that would offer plants that would offer the food that the native animals I don't think that that's an issue. I think that's very interesting. Uh, again, for online, the question was, what role does invasive, you know, whether a plant's invasive or not, or I guess, um, not necessarily invasive, but non-native. Uh, I think we're generally going for the macronutrients that are in those leaves. Um, you know, the carbon, the nitrogen, the potassium, the, yeah, the higher level things uh, as they break down. I have not heard anybody say that it matters of that. Of course, if there's seeds in there and your compost doesn't get hot enough, they may spring up all over the place. And that's, that could happen. But okay, so I'll go on. And I'd like to, I, I think, Greer and Christine might want me to take questions at the end just to make sure. Or are you okay with it? Okay. Okay. So we'll see. We'll keep going. Um, okay. Okay. So this was about uh, protecting things. Also, asparagus. I love putting layers of, of leaves over my asparagus beds to insulate the root crowns. And then that way I can peel back some of the leaves early in the spring and I get the first crop of asparagus and you can pull it back. You can kind of unveil it bit by bits so that you don't get all your asparagus at once. But that's, uh, that takes a little practice, but it's kind of fun. So. A, a layer of shredded leaves is also a great way to extend the season, uh, especially of your vegetable patches. 
uh, past frost. There's a garden author named Nikki Jabour who recommends using actually a one foot layer of leaves, uh, shredded leaves uh, before frost over all of your root vegetables. If you have, if you still have carrots or turnips, um, other root crops in the ground, she says to just bury them in these. And this will prevent the ground around these they're cold tolerant crops anyway, but it keeps the ground from freezing so the vegetables themselves won't freeze and then rot. And she lives up in Nova Scotia, so she knows about cold weather and, real, and lots of you know, months and months of snow, cold weather. If you're in a windy location, you can use a, a sheet, a row cover, or even just a sheet like this to kind of go over it. This is pinned down with lands, uh, landscape staples. Uh, because if you have a big mound in a small spot, they really might all blow away. So, um, so you can put them in that way. Um, I, as I mentioned earlier, I find that shredded leaves generally stay put, but I don't think I've ever put a full foot on top of anything either, and that might blow away. Um, so this way you might actually be able to go out and harvest fresh, delicious carrots and beets on Thanksgiving morning, even Christmas or you know holidays, New Year's, uh, so you can, can do this. Uh, kale and spinach are also very cold hardy and uh, they can be protected by layers of leaves as well through the winter. Um, if you run out of leaves, you can use straw or shredded straw like you might use on uh, a new lawn, seeded lawn to, to be an insulator. I personally don't bury cabbage because I've found that voles, little, very cute little furry animals that are vegetarian, uh, they look a lot like mice but with bigger ears, I find that they like, they seem to eat cabbage in my life and they, you don't know the cabbage is eaten until you pick it out, <laughs> until you harvest it and it's been hollowed out in the middle, like something you'd put dip in at a party. <laughs> <laughs> and it just, it's been a big surprise. So, but for other things like kale, you know, spinach, things like that, it, it seems to work pretty well. Another thing that you can do with your leaves, and this is another, you know, super easy uh, thing, and I think kind of a lazy way is to make, uh, to make your own leaf mulch or leaf compost. Um, about 19 years ago, when I first moved to Princeton, uh, you know, we had just moved in. We'd moved here from Arizona, though I grew up in New Jersey. Um, and we were, um, we were prepping for a big family party. So we were running around. Everybody was coming for the first time. And we had leaves all over the place in the fall. And so like we quick put them in bags and I shoved them in back out of sight at the back of our property uh, behind some big viburnum bushes. And I promptly forgot about them. But it looked tidy for the in-laws, so <laughs> who probably didn't even care, but anyway. Um, in the spring, several months later, I found the bags and I was amazed. They had not been closed tightly because I was in a big rush and the leaves had composted down on their own. You know, there was plenty of leaf mold on there that got it going. They need, they can't be closed. They need to have moisture. They need to have water for this to work. But I actually had these nice bags. You know, there were some big lumps in there too, but it was really pretty great uh, leaf compost after about six months without doing anything. Um, a friend of mine, uh, I had used black trash bags. A friend of mine says that she always uses clear bags, believes that that works better, but it's something to try. Um, you might want to even poke holes in the bags just to make sure that they get, uh, get the moisture. Uh, so that's another thing. Uh, let's see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So some people uh, driving around, you start to see bags like this around Halloween. So you could um, maybe even use some of these uh, as decoration, fill them up with leaves. And then I have never tried this, but you might want to try poking some holes in these and putting them out of sight, unless you don't mind looking at it and seeing if they compost down. There's a little bit of a caution here though, because these bags are pretty thin. They're very, very thin plastic. So they might not hold up to being lifted and transported around. Um, and also in the spring, if the bag breaks, you might have little shreds of plastic in your compost. And I, I don't like that kind of thing. Yeah, so that's the thing. But it might be bright orange, so you could see it and pick it out. Um, 
So I tend to use heavier bags. Yes? Um, I often, when I put the leaves out, I don't add moisture to it. I just let them be open to the rain because it's happening in the fall for the most part. And then hopefully in the winter, there's some snow too. Uh, and so it gets, we get a fair amount of rain usually in the fall. It's our rainiest time. So I've never measured it. Yeah. Kind of open. With, with a, yeah. Like rolled, rolled yeah. open some. I've never tried this just with paper bags. I don't see why it wouldn't work, but the paper bags would probably fall apart in compost too. So, um, hmm? they last. They last. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. If you have the time and the geography, the space on your properties, you can do the same thing without a bag. It might even work better just making a leaf pile. Uh, and if you don't mind, you know, mind having it there, you can just use use the leaves and just let them stay there and, and see what happens. Most people say that they do compost down within, you know, by the next year. Yeah. And it's just that if you only live on, you know, a 10th of an acre, you might not have that space. But if you have a bigger property, you might have somewhere where you can just rake everything and let it sit and let it stay. And it's, it's very easy. It's kind of the lazy way to do it, but it's pretty great. You can then just go out in the spring and, and, um, you know, put it into a bucket or a wheelbarrow and add it to your, your flower beds, different places. Or if you don't even want to use it, you can just then start putting more leaves on top of it. I personally would not mix in brush and other things because the wood is going to be uh, hard. It'll take a lot longer to break down. So anyway, I, I like the, you know, move it and let it sit kind of mode often. Another thing, until now, I've only mentioned basically broadleaf leaves, uh, but a lot of us, you know, don't forget about the evergreens out there. Our white pines um, in particular drop their needles. You know, they'll start dropping them probably pretty soon if they haven't already. And you can use them either directly in your compost or you can use them straight. Sometimes online you'll read that, oh, they're you know, their, uh, their pH isn't, is harmful, but I would not worry about that. It, your compost will, will self-regulate it. The, the pH won't be a problem. And there are acid-loving plants. If you grow blueberries or ostrich ferns, think about uh, the pine bar plants in the Pine Barrens or up in the Delaware Water Gap. That's where the needles fall naturally. And those plants thrive. I, in my life, they've thrived by having being mulched with pine needles. I also really like uh, to make a path. I have a very muddy path, shady, it never sees sun <laughs> uh, along the side of my house. And I go around and I collect <laughs> pine needles from the street in front of neighbors because I don't have a white pine tree myself. It's a little kooky. I don't do it under the cover of darkness. Nobody minds if I take their pine needles. Sometimes I go over to my congregation because they just fall onto the parking lot and they're really easy to, to rake up on a, a dry day. And I put them in. Uh, and I find that it has made a very nice path here. And I, I can dream that it's a little woodland path <laughs> uh, covered with, with pine needles that don't actually fall off of the tree, making it shady next to them. Um, there are places around the country that consistently use pine needles as mulch, especially in the southern United States, where they call it pine straw, and people buy pine straw. So this is one of the elements where it's really not seen as a, a problem with the pH. Some people think they blow around. The area where I put them doesn't get much wind. It's protected, so I don't have a problem with them blowing around either. So. You know, galloping on. Uh, of course, if you're composting, and I think we're getting closer and closer, there's some states like Vermont that require people to compost at home to keep all your food waste, manage it yourself. Um, if you're composting, leaves are a fabulous resource to help your food break down. And uh, this is one of the favorite things that I do with our fall leaves as well. Uh, so I just have to keep them in the, you know, because by the time I'm going through food and, and waste in spring and summer, I've run out of leaves unless I've saved them. And uh, to, well, yeah, so, 
So you need to plan to have the leaves for your compost. They take up a lot less space if you shred them because you know you can see here there's four bins of leaves. When I shredded them, they came out, all four of those bins equal this bin, one bin. You know, so it's a much uh, more compact way to store the leaves for your use. So how do you shred them? Well, there's a couple of different ways. You could win the shredder <laughs> that's being given away today, uh, which is a wonderful thing. And here's a uh, my friend, Catherine Hor co-author Catherine Horgan's husband, using uh, a mount, a different variety, but it's a one that fits uh, that you can set right onto a barrel and dump leaves into it. Um, I have often used um, our leaf blower. It has a a switch where I can make it into like a vacuum. You can uh, make it run backwards, and then it'll collect the leaves and shred them and store them into a bag. And then I can just put them onto garden. It's a very neat and tidy way to then put the shredded leaves onto a garden bed or something like that. If you do that, I'd recommend, it's really loud, so you might want to have ear protection, um, something like that. Another thing that I do, which is, <laughs> might be a little extreme, but again, I like to use the tools that I already have. And I have a leaf, um, you know, a, a trimmer. My British friend calls it a strimmer. Uh, yeah. <laughs> And uh, I use it, uh, like you can see here, it's like a giant immersion blender. You know, I put the dry leaves in and you just go up and down. And it doesn't take very much time at all. It just shreds them all down to, to tiny little bits. So you just have, again, you should wear eye protection because bits will fly out at you. And you should probably protect your ears as well. Uh, but if you're only doing it for five minutes, maybe it's not too much. Um, but this is, uh, this is my strimming <laughs> of leaves. That's one bucket on the left, me working the string, trim, or the string trimmer up and down. And then that's how they, they all broke down to just that. So it worked well. I believe, but I, don't, I have not seen any scientific studies of this. Maybe I just hope that if you gather your leaves quickly in the fall, and then do this, that maybe you don't have as much insect larva danger of destruction on them. I'm hoping that then when I put, you know, that, and these are leaves that I want to use in my composting anyway, so there's that. But I do believe that if you put your freshly um, shredded leaves on your gardens, that some of those insects will still find places uh, for them to lay their larvae and, and uh, keep the life cycle going. So this is another way just to, uh, to control your leaves is to put them in bins sort of with a wire or snow fencing so that you always have a supply of the leaves uh, for composting because you might not have enough of the big uh, recycle bins or trash cans or whatever to keep them in. And I believe some of you might be signed up to make one of these leaf corrals today with Sustainable Princeton. So, uh, I think theirs will be round. These particular ones are square, so you can just see the, the different ways. And then this way you have leaves whenever you need them for your compost, and there's a, a little compost bin right next door. I like to have them nearby, so I dump in the kitchen scraps or food, and then I take a handful or two of leaves and bury them. So. Yeah, um, it's true. We. We advise, as master gardeners in Mercer County, we advise not to use meat. And some people even say no cooked food. But I think if it's a straight vegetable and it's cooked, I go ahead and put it in mine. Um, there is the fear that meat might attract vermin, particularly rats and raccoons, things like that. Um, yeah, so we try not to, to use those in. Yes, yeah, you try generally try not to unless you have a system that's well closed uh or you know otherwise authorized to to do that but it's it's rough and i'm not sure what they're advising to people in vermont you know if they're allowed to throw bones into the trash or not um but anyway here's some finished compost it's a uh, dark beautiful crumbly garden gold it's a wonderful thing so here's my last little thing. And there's some crafts out there for children. Um, autumn leaves are beautiful. I mean, 
we tend to get overwhelmed with the task of dealing with them, but they are so pretty and you can make lots of things out of them. Most of us would be challenged to actually use all of them in craft projects that fall, but you can do lots of things. You can make garlands, you can make all kinds of things. Um, and my family every year makes scarecrows, or at least we used to. And this is, um, you know, when our kids were younger, we used their old, we, well, I kept some of their clothes, old clothes. We put a pumpkin out front before Halloween and stuff the clothes with leaves. And there's a, there's a stake going up the back to make them stand upright because I haven't gotten them to stand up. And yeah, so we do that. My son did not, this was 10 years ago, he did not want his picture taken doing this. <laughs> He's not glum. Um, yeah, but these are one little glitch I've found over the last uh, couple of years is that our leaves are not falling as reliably before Halloween anymore. I've the last couple of years, I, I literally haven't had enough leaves in my lawn to make the scarecrows. So, oh, uh, really? <laughs> That's good. But this is something. And so here's a review. Thank you very much for attending. Um, these are the seven different ways and they're listed on your on the handout. And I do hope that you can enrich and make your home more beautiful and healthier environments. As uh, one of my heroes, Doug Tallamy, says, you know, we want to make every yard part of the homegrown national park. And so if you practice sustainable processes at home, you can uh, keep everything uh, healthier in our environment. And then um, these are some of the links. I think all of these are on the handout, uh, but these are just a couple of them as well. Sometimes our lawn workers only speak Spanish, and so there is a link in there where you can find some Spanish directions if you don't speak Spanish. And then just another uh, call out to Helpline, uh, the Master Gardener Helpline. Here's the contact hours. You can contact us in different ways. You can come in in person. It's down in in Ewing Township um, during the working hours. You can call and leave a message anytime and the Master Gardener will get back to you, not necessarily the same day, but within a week at least. Um, or you can email, you can ask the MGs and get an email response. And that's a great way because you can send a, a photograph of your problem now to our helpline. Or you can come visit the tent, sometimes at street fairs. I know they were here at uh, Princeton Porch Fest in front of the library, so there's places around. So thank you again very much. <laughs> Hi. Hi. Um, should I, are there any questions online? I don't know. Um, so or what, uh, or what's uh, the right time? Oh, it's three. Um, I wanted to just mention at the end of the Q&A, we're going to uh, do our raffle oh. uh, for the electric leaf blower. So if you want to um, join the raffle, you can do so while we're doing uh, Q&A, um, and then I'll call it at the end. So now, uh, any questions? Yes. yes. I, I have a lot of prunings from my lavender. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I'm waiting to prune. I mean, I've been pretty successful. But, um, and so I wait until it's brown and the bees have stopped coming for it, and then I get dead. Yeah. So okay, that's so just the wands. But, yeah, but sometimes I'm just. The leaves too. Okay. Anyway, I have some bottom of that. It's actually still smelling nice. Mm -hmm. In my garage, and my plan is to put it around the, you know, after I mulch the base of these plants that I get really neat mulching, um, put the lavender on top, and maybe the lavender would tell me. I think you might. want to put it on the lavender itself or just everywhere. I actually oh, think I'm, I'm with you. I think that if, yeah, I think that if you don't. You know, if you don't mind it looking like, you know, perfectly black mulch, yeah, it'll be fine. And I'm with you. I, I don't know, but it does, it sounds like a very good, it sounds very plausible to me that the scent will keep the pests away. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's great. It sounds like you have six, uh-huh. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, sure. You're welcome. 
Did you? Um, yes. I do. So I'm not a gardener. Um, We're all gardeners. You just haven't started yet. I have too many trees, with oh, yeah. too much shade, yeah. and too many leaves. So I'm, I'm, in, I'm at war with my leaves. Uh -huh. And my question for you is about volume. You're right. Um, I have so many leaves yeah. um, that I'm wondering if I have a, a, a wooded area on the edge of mm -hmm. my property. Um, can I just put them there? Yes. Okay. Yeah, and you just should not be even able have to. to yeah. Shred them or anything. Yeah, I. Is it an area that you can see from your house, or like? Do you, I mean, yeah. if you don't mind it, I think that that's perfectly fine. And I, I saw nods when I talked about piling them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they will break down. Like They'll fit. Yeah. Leave it. Mm -hmm. yeah. And within two to three days, the leaves are dead. You know, I was and I was Crunchy. trying to rake them to put. You know, now they have the dates that you can put stuff out. You know, you yeah. Can put your leaves on the date that the guy is there. Mm -hmm. So I had to rake all of them into a pile, and it was like nothing. They were so light and crispy. Mm -hmm. Once you start interacting with them, I'm telling you, you just realize how nutrient dense they are and how valuable they are. You know, it will change your life. Huh. Yeah, no, I think, Michelle, I think that's a great possibility. Um, I, there are probably things that can go wrong, and I'll try to, if, I, if they occur to me, I'll try to get back to you. I'm just thinking there could be, you know, home for a fox or something but that's not so bad if you don't mind there's there's foxes everywhere anyway so yeah uh as long as they're not too high on the tree trunks but they'll probably settle down yeah, I have area where I can spread it out. yeah i mean that's great that sounds like because again in the forest nobody rakes them up you know they, they just them into, there's leaves yeah. falling in there already and it works just fine so you're just Adding more leaves for that. Yeah. Really I really to want somebody to do a test of people with rakes and people with blowers and to see, because I just have this hunch, like you see them using the blower over and over and over. And I feel my instinct is that raking is about the same amount. It's just, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. But the but the people that come in and blow, they just seem to keep going over it, chasing single leaves. Yeah. Anyway, uh, yes, I'm sorry. You've had your hand up a lot. Oh, yes. Uh -huh. I, I should have brought the picture of that. Uh, the, the, that must sound silly. Which layer? Is it? There is five layers. Oh, so which one's on the top? Which okay. One? Yeah, there's not. Um, let's see. Um, it's not an exact science. I think I'm going back to it. Yeah. Number one is the first layer. Yeah, the bottom would that this bottom one would be cardboard, le okay, level one so on the bottom. On the bottom. Okay. And then on top of that, I'd put something that's not brown. The cardboard's brown. Okay. Um, and then the green, you know, clippings, vegetable scraps, things like this. And then on top of that, you can put another brown layer. And it, I mean, it depends on how high you want it to go. Some people do it with just, you know, one or two layers. Yeah, yeah I, those layers were not hugely thick when I put them in that fall, but they were, it ended up being maybe about that high, but be, within a month it had shrunk down. Yeah, because the weight of the finished compost on top makes it go down and I just put, I just planted bulbs right into it. Actually, I put flower bulbs like daffodils and stuff right around on the top. And then I put the compost over it. So I didn't even have to dig to plant the bulbs. It was really, it was really lazy. Yeah, <laughs> and it was good. Okay, thanks. But make sure you leave the flare on your tree if you can. Yeah, Janet. Okay, so I have these uh, bird feeders. I have mm -hmm. lots of shells on the ground. Ah. So, ah. okay, get rid of them? Or it depends. <laughs> I don't know about all bird food, like, like by far. I don't know about all bird food. But I do know that sunflower seed hulls have certain components in them that inhibit growth. It's kind of like having a black walnut tree. And so if your bird feeder, if your bird seed has a lot of the sunflower seed hulls, you might want to be careful what it's over. Um, 
a long time ago on Helpline at Master Gardeners, a call came in, somebody had planted this prized family heirloom, um, I think it was a hydrangea, that had been in their great grandmother's house and somebody had moved in, somebody moved in, and they now had it. And it was ailing, it was really dying. And it turned out that it, there was a bird feeder over it and it was the sunflower seeds that were affecting it. They moved the shrub and it recovered just fine. As far as I know, sunflower seed hulls are the only ones that would do that. Uh, yeah, sometimes, uh, especially if you have squirrels around, they're not tidy. So some of the seeds may fall down and sometimes they sprout too. So, but I don't think that they hurt uh, for the most part. Uh, and if it's between plants, you can just, if you don't like how it looks, you can just put a little compost over it or shredded leaves, you know. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? Um, so we have um, a, quite a few questions online, which we probably won't be able to get to oh. today. Oh, but okay. I'll address a couple, but I did want to mention for those online, um, Louise and I can chat and send you the, uh, the answers to your questions. We will also send a PDF copy of the resource guide um, via email, as well as a recording of today's program. Uh -oh. So <laughs> it's always my horror. <laughs> um, uh. Sorry, I'm just juggling my yeah. laptop here. So um, one question, um, how do deciduous trees affect the garden? Oh, well, uh, there's shade, of course. <laughs> uh, and their leaves are a wonderful resource for us. That's what we've been talking about. Uh, they're called deciduous trees because their leaves fall off. And then that's what we're talking about. It's wonderful to use those leaves and keep them on your landscape uh, to contribute nutrients to your soil. And our gardens, we think gardens are all about what we see, you know, the beautiful flowers and the butterflies that land on them. It's actually all about the soil. It's what your gardens are what you feed the soil and that's where you get things growing out of them. If that, that's a vague statement, but that's, that's great. Yeah. Uh, and one final question, because um, I think it's a, it's a good one. Um, how do we, how do we um, uh, navigate discussions with landscapers oh, about um, our leaves uh, who claim that this will put them out of business? Okay, I would, Christine uh, from Sustainable Princeton has her hand raised. You wanna come up here or? Sure. Uh, so you can be seen by those at home. I love that you're taking this because I'm not really sure. You know, there are Spanish instructions you can get, but yeah, go for it. Yeah, I, I want to say what's really important is when we think about the landscaping uh, community, they're very hard workers. Yes. And um, what we've come to understand is there are probably over 100 different landscaping companies that do business in our area. And they are, majority of them are small, one owner, two crews, with maybe four or five um, employees or crew members that they, they have working for them. And they operate on very narrow margins. And the sort of the paradigm of their practice is what's called a mow, blow, and go crew. And that is been driven by the consumer's paradigm of a manicured lawn. So if we want to change about change the landscaping business, we have to understand that homeowners and property owners are co-responsible for this change. And what we've been trying to do over the past uh, couple of years is to facilitate dialogues between property owners and the landscaping community to sort of co-create a new type of way that we manage our properties. Um, one thing that we've done is put together um, a little bit of a uh, a toolkit or so with some um, common phrases in Spanish that you can use to communicate to your landscaper. You need to understand the folks that may be coming up to your property are probably um, not the foreman or the, the person in charge. It may be just the crew that day. Um, so you may want to talk directly to the landscaper that you hire. They probably do speak English, um, so you can have a, a dialogue with them. Another thing that we've done at Stanwell Princeton is we've um, 
been, uh, you know, reaching out to the landscaping community and uh, encouraging them to adopt these practices. And we have a sustainable landscaper list on our website. So we've sent out a questionnaire to all the landscapers that we know of that are doing business because um, uh, through just going out and seeing what trucks are around town, finding who's registered with the municipality. Side note, if you hire a landscaper in the municipality of Princeton, please make sure they are registered. It is required that they register with the municipality. And this was put in place as a means to try to reduce wage theft. This is something we heard from the landscaping community that they wanted and they want the town to enforcement because there are many good businesses um, out there trying to do the right thing. And um, they also asked that the town require proof of workers compensation insurance. Um, so we can do our part if you hire a landscaper to make sure they're registered. Um, and uh, you can look on our website to see a list of landscapers that will mulch your leaves, leave your leaves, that uh, will offer these type of services. Um, so I just really want to get the point across. We need to respect the landscaping community, not, see, not demonize them because of the practices they may have, or the equipment that they use, and see uh, ourselves as Prop, if we're a property owner and we're hiring landscapers, our neighbors are hiring the landscapers, that they are part of the solution. Thanks. Thank you so much, Christine. Um, a tiny bit more about dealing with your la landscapers. Um, I have found that some, some landscapers are resistant to mulch mowing, uh, to leaving the uh, grass clippings in the lawn, to mulch mowing. And again, you just need to try to understand it from their perspective. If more and more and more of us ask for that, then they'll make it. But sometimes they have to adjust their equipment from household to household or manage property to manage property. And, and that can be confusing. Also, they tend to mow, you know, unless it's pouring rain, if your lawn's a little bit wet, they're probably gonna come mow it anyway because they have a tight schedule if they're successful because of that low profit margin. They've got to get it done. And if they're mulching when it's a little bit wet, sometimes there's lumps left and some people will complain about that. Others of us love it because it's proof that they're, you know, mulching the grass clippings in. So that's, that's my little warning. But I think it's really important for homeowner to contact your homeowners associations and your, um, you know, I don't know what the others, the management, property management companies. Uh, we can do things as homeowners, but it'd be great if these other places could work on this too. Okay, so that's it. Thank, so thank you have... so much, Louise. <laughs> now, I know the sun is out, and now I'm gonna do the drawing for the, the leaf flower. <laughs> All right. We have a Michelle. Oh, yes. All right. <laughs> Wow.